PhD student in uh, Dr. Geyser's lab in the Plant Pathology and Environmental Microbiology Department um, at Penn State. And his research revolves around the fungal genus Fusarium and um, its impacts on sort of human and animal um, infection. And with that, please welcome Chris Smith. Hello. Uh, as Courtney said, my name is Chris Smith. Uh, and uh, one of uh, my passions in life is fungi, and I'm lucky enough to be able to study it full time here at Penn State. And one of the biggest challenges I had with coming up with what to talk about today was there's just so much fungi to pack into 15 minutes that it's, it's really impossible. So I, so I went ahead and uh, looked up ways to try and get you interested, and I found that uh, clickbait articles seem to be a great way to do that, so I took the BuzzFeed method. And I'm going to tell you about 15 fantastic fungal facts that you probably didn't know, and I promise that number six will leave you speechless. <laughs> First and foremost, let's see, what am I pointing this at? Oops. There we go. Okay. First and foremost, I want to talk about something that's, that's it's a common error uh, that, that people make, and that's, they tend to think that, that mushrooms and fungi are actually really closely related to plants. And while they are in the same domain, the eukarya, uh, they're actually, fungi are more closely related to animals than they are to plants. If you took apart a human cell by cell and you took apart a fungus cell by cell, you would see that their cells look a lot similar to each other than a fungal cell looks to a plant cell, per se. And I really like this little diagram here. It kind of gives you a better, uh, a better visual for, for where on the tree of life these organisms fall. Um, and one of the reasons that fungi are often mistaken as plants is because there's a portion of the fungi uh, that produce mushrooms that you see in your backyard, you see in the forest. And, and while these mushrooms can often resemble plants, and a lot of people will mistake them for plants, uh, they're not. In fact, the mushroom itself is actually the fruiting body of the fungus. The actual body of the fungus is found below the ground in what's called a mycelium. That's our name for the body of the fungus. And what we, um, one, one comparison I like to make is, is a mushroom is to a fungus like an apple is to a tree. A mushroom is a way for the fungus to reproduce. And so we'll only see the mushrooms for part of the time uh, while the, the fungus itself is still living below the ground. So that brings me to fun fact number two. 90% of all plants need fungi to live. Uh, plants and fungi uh, have a mutually, and some fungi have a mutually beneficial relationship. These are called mycorrhizae, and there are several types of mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, and uh, one, I'm, I'm at the risk of missing a lot of key information in this story, I, I do want to tell a little bit of a story about uh, some scientists who went out to do a project looking at these mycorrhizal fungi, and what they did is they went out into the forest and they found a whole bunch of different species of trees, and they found a few trees, and they put big plastic bags over some of the trees, you know, the ones they could fit the plastic bags over, and the, these trees couldn't photosynthesize anymore, they couldn't get, uh, create the sugars that they need. And they used uh, a radio-labeled carbon and, and inserted it into a variety of different trees uh, in the forest, around the, those trees, and they found that over several weeks to months that this carbon was actually being shuttled through the mycelium underground, the fungal mycelium, to other trees of different species. In a sense, these fungi are actually playing a role in nutrient mediators uh, and, and really playing a role in improving overall forest ecosystem health. And that's something that we really need to keep in mind when we're dealing with restoration. So whether it be a salt marsh or a forest, uh, Keeping in mind that, that restoring an ecosystem is not just putting a plant in the ground, it's also thinking about the microbial communities and especially the fungi that live uh, underneath the soil. So fun fact number three, these are some of my favorite fungi. They're actually specifically adapted to life in fresh water. They're called the Engoldian fungi, and they have these incredible little appendages that allow them to tumble through fast-moving streams, and when they find a substrate to land on, like a leaf in the water, they'll, they'll adhere to the leaf in a tripod stance, and they'll start to degrade the leaf. And they actually play a very important role in transferring nutrients from leaves and other, decomposing, other decomposable materials in the stream bed to the rest of the freshwater ecosystem. And yes, there actually is an example of a fungus that fruits underwater. This is the only known example. This is Scythiorella aquatica, and it's only found in the Rogue River in Oregon. Uh, and it actually fruits. The mushroom actually forms out of the sediment. Uh, and so we don't really know how it disperses its spores, but uh, we do know that when it releases its spores underneath the cap here, it goes, all the spores go into this, this 
uh, kind of a large air bubble, uh, and they think that maybe aquatic insects play a role in, in helping to distribute that when they climb on the, uh, on the fungus. So, fun fact number four is that mushrooms actually can make their own wind. So when a mushroom is about to uh, release its spores, it produces a water vapor, and that water va vapor evaporates, cooling the air around the mushroom. The cooler air is more dense and moves away from the mushroom and causes a lift that can take the spores up to four inches horizontally or vertically away from the mushroom. Fun fact number five, the, fa the fastest accelerating organism on Earth is a fungus. This is Palobolus, also known as the hat-growing fungus, uh, because of these little black globules up here. These are actually spores, and this uh, organism actually accelerates faster uh, than any uh, gun can shoot a bullet, uh, and it's considered the fastest accelerating organism on the planet. And one of the coolest things about it is it actually grows on poop. And if you ever take a mycology class, you really spend a whole lot of time looking at poop because there's some amazing fungi that grow on this stuff. And uh, specifically, it grows on herbivore poop uh, because the herbivores will eat the spores out in the environment, out in the, out often, not eat the spores themselves, but they'll eat the grass that has the spores on it. And the spores will go through the digestive tract where we think they're actually activated and uh, they'll grow and start to decompose the dung uh, when after the uh, herbivores do their business. And one of the most interesting things about that is the, uh, these guys, Palobolus, actually have little photoreceptors up in these fruiting bodies here that allow them to detect the angle of the sun. And at a certain angle, they'll actually fire their spores. Uh, and they do that because you don't want to shoot your spores right up in the air because it'll land back in the poop and an herbivore is not going to eat its own poop, right? So you want to get your spores out in the grass around the surrounding poop and that's how the life cycle continues. Fun fact number six and the one that's supposed to leave you speechless is that fungi can have up to 28,000 sexes. Sex is a very complicated thing with fungi. Uh, this is Schizophyllum communi, also known as the split gill fungus. Uh, and schizophyllum actually has hundreds upon hundreds and upon hundreds of genes that are associated with mating. And when it's out looking for a mate, it has to find another schizophyllum that has a different gene at every, or a different allele at every single one of those genes. So it can't have the same allele in any of those genes. Number seven. The largest organism on Earth is a fungus. And when I say that, I don't mean a giant mushroom. What I mean is the mycelial body that I talked about earlier, uh, also known as the humongous fungus, is actually um, found out in the Malcular uh, National Wildlife Refuge in Oregon. A lot of these fungi are in Oregon for some reason. Uh, and uh, it's about 2,200 acres and is estimated at 2,400 uh, years old. And, and they were able to tell how large it is because they can sample the fruiting bodies of the fungus called armillaria, uh, and they can sample the fruiting bodies and they can use DNA sequencing then to uh, tell whether uh, it's the same individual or a different individual. And so this is the humongous fungus. So naturally when we talk about the humongous fungus, the botanists jump in and they say, oh well, we have a large clonal organism too, uh, Pando, the trembling giant, um, which is a, a quaking aspen clonal colony uh, out in uh, Utah. And so all of these yellowish trees here are actually one living organism with a single root system, and it's the heaviest organism on Earth, weighing about uh, 6 million kilograms. Fascinating fact number eight is that there are about 30 species of bioluminescent fungi, and one of my first experiences with fungi was actually right here in our own backyard out in Lamar, walking out into the forest in the middle of the night, uh, and being told to stare at a dead and decomposing trunk until the fungi started to glow. And it was really fascinating. So I highly recommend if you're looking for something to do on Saturday night, go find the state game lands and walk out into the middle of the woods and stare at some dead and decomposing trunks for a while. You won't regret it. Fascinating fact number nine, the truffle is one of the most expensive foods in the world. The truffle actually produces a gas that gives it its really desirable taste. And in fact, you can actually use pigs to hunt for troubles, truffles. Uh, that being said, truffles are also very hard to cultivate. Truffle, the fruiting body of the, uh, of the truffle seen here, is produced underground. In mycology, we use the term hypogeus to describe these, these fungi. Uh, so it, it's very hard to uh, cultivate, and so a lot of the the ones that are sold in the market are actually wild, uh, wildly foraged truffles, and they can reach up to $10,000 per pound. Uh, 
So yes, the most expensive, one of the most expensive foods in the world. So uh, number 10 is a fascinating fact that's a little more near and dear to my heart because this is something that I work on. Uh, and it's that fungal infections are actually an increasingly common cause of decline in wildlife. There are a variety of diseases being caused, that are caused by fungi that are eradicating different wildlife populations throughout North America, throughout the Americas, and throughout the world. Uh, first, we have white nose syndrome, which is an infection, uh, a disease in, in bats in North America. It's killed over 7 million bats since its arrival here in 2006, and there seems to be no end in sight at this point. Uh, Chytridiomycosis uh, is a major player in the decline of amphibians worldwide, uh, especially frogs in the case of one of the uh, one of the species, and now there's a new species that's arisen in Europe that infects salamanders, and we are very much concerned about that species getting here to North America. Then there's snake fungal disease, one of the most creative names that they could have come up with. Um, where, and, and for as cool as it really is, it actually rots the face off of the snake while they're in hibernation. And we don't know much about this fungus other than what it is and a few of its biological, ecological characteristics. Um, but we know that we're seeing it more and more throughout North America, and there are several threatened species of rattlesnakes and other snakes uh, that, are, that are really in a, in a bad position because of this. And then finally, uh, what I'm currently working on is a, a disease called sea turtle fusariosis. And what this is, is essentially fungi um, will completely overtake nests of sea turtles uh, and we, we're not really sure where the fungus is coming from, and we're not really sure uh, why. And we think there might be some level of environmental change at play here, maybe in beaches that are eroding. And we see more tidal inundation up further, uh, drowning or, or wetting the eggs enough that the fungus can just grow and just completely wipe out entire nests of sea turtle eggs. Um, so, on to a more lighter note. Uh, <laughs> For every cubic meter of air, there are about 10,000 fungal spores. So you're breathing in fungi every day. In fact, there are tons of fungi that are associated with the indoor environment that you interact with on a daily basis. There are fungal, fungi that are allergens. There are, there are fungi that are human pathogens that are in places as common as your sink drain. Um, and, uh, but our immune system does a really amazing job at fighting off fungi. And it kind of goes back to that fun fact number one, that we are so closely related to fungi on the tree of life that, uh, that our, our immune system is really good at recognizing the, the telltale signs of a fungus infection. Um, however, when uh, your immune system goes down or you're immunocompromised for some reason, uh, you become a lot more susceptible to these fungal diseases and they're a lot more fatal and harder to fight. Fascinating fact number 12, some fungi actually enjoy a good nematode rodeo. Uh, so these are some of my favorite fungi. This is Arthrobotrys, and Arthrobotrys is a predatory fungus that sits in wait for nematode prey, and what happens is when a nematode's swimming around in the environment, uh, it releases some sort of a chemical signal that something can detect that it's there, like a scent, essentially. And when that fungus detects the scent of, of the nematode, it'll start to form these hypo loops. And eventually a nematode will go wiggling through and it'll get itself caught in one of these hypo loops. And when it does, the fungus fills these loops up with water and constricts the nematode, trapping it, and then it'll start to excrete its digestive system, essentially, the enzymes that degrade the nematode, and it'll, it'll degrade it alive. Uh, so a really crazy, interesting fungus that we use a lot in mycology classes to teach students and, uh, about uh, the variety of fungi that you come across. Fun fact number 13, some fungi are really, really good at bioremediation, and uh, this is a really interesting area of study. Um, we know that fungi can actually, some fungi can degrade things like dioxins, petroleum products, uh, pesticides, and even chemical warfare agents like uh, sarin gas. Uh, they've been shown to be able to degrade, and actually, uh, this guy, the oyster mushroom, was, was shown to degrade uh, some uh, hydrocarbon uh, spill, some oil spill down in... Um, down in the Gulf of Mexico after the Deepwater Horizon, they, they took some of these and they tried to, to grow them on, on contaminated sand and were able to kind of remediate some of the sand areas in a little experiment uh, to see what, what could fungi really do in the field of bioremediation. There's a huge, there's so much I could talk about about micro, we call it micro remediation. Um, there's so much I could talk about there, but uh, I'm probably running out of time at this point. <laughs> um, so, Fungi don't just live on land, and they live in the, they live in the ocean too. And the ocean maybe isn't something you, somewhere you would think that a fungus might actually live. 
Uh, but there are several types of different, several types of fungi that live in the ocean. We, we actually classify them into two categories. Facultative, which are essentially visitors to the ocean that also live elsewhere, like on land and in freshwater ecosystems. And then there's obligate fungi, and they actually, to complete their life cycles, if they are required to stay in the ocean environment. And one of the coolest, and, and we really don't know much about all these guys, uh, but one of the coolest of these organisms is uh, this little guy named uh, Colos Colospora maritima. And so this is a small sexual fruiting body of Colospora, uh, and it actually attaches its fruiting body called an ascus to sand grains. And it just hangs out in the intertidal zone, going back and forth with the current, attached to the sand grains. And if you break open one of those little assi, uh, you can find their little their spores, and they kind of look really alien-like and are really neat looking. So. If you're ever walking the beach and you want to pick up some sand, uh, there's a really amazing collection of marine fungi up in the New York Botanical Garden, and a good portion of it is some, from someone who just went and picked up a bunch of like uh, styrofoam trash and, and other things uh, that happen to have things growing on them, and the marine fungi. Uh, so really interesting stuff. And finally, fascinating fact number 15, you can make surfboards and other cool stuff out of mushroom mycelium. So there's this really fantastic company up in New York called Ecovative, and they uh, have figured out how to make a surfboard, a functioning surfboard out of mushroom mycelium, but they also make tons of other things like packaging materials to replace styrofoam is the idea, and also building materials as well. So they have tons of awesome projects going on, and I really highly recommend check out their website and see what they're, see what they're uh, up to research-wise, because they always have some fascinating projects going on. And so with that, I hope that these 15 facts kind of give you uh, uh, an idea of all the really fascinating things that the fungal world encompasses. And there's tons more I wish I could have talked about, uh, but I think uh, that'll have to do for now. So uh, thank you. Cordyceps, um, the so-called uh, zombie ant fungus. So he's going to talk a little bit today about um, that. So, welcome, Joel. Thank you. Where is the light? Mm -hmm. Cool. So I don't I don't speak very well like Chris. Does, but I will try to do my best to communicate what I have today. So I will be talking about entomopathogenic fungi, which yeah. is a group <laughs> of fungus that infect insects. And that's a, a huge diversity of these kind of fungus worldwide, from deserts and ocean, not ocean, sorry, and freshwater and aquatic system to the most dry lands, like uh, desert in Africa. So they're, they're able to infect like many different kinds of insects, as you, you see in the next slides. So that's, uh, here it's, it's kind of hard to see, but that's a cartoon phylogeny of the all orders of insects. And here, the, the groups of fungi that infect insects, and here it's also include all my seeds. They're not uh, fungus anymore. It used to be considered as a, as a fungus, but now it's a stramenopile organism. And here we see which, which group of insect is infected by which group of, sorry, which group of, uh, of fungus. Here's a, one example of uh, aquatic uh, fungi. So that's the Coelomomyces achytri that requires two holes to complete their life cycle. So they, they start infecting a copepod, a cyclops, the genus cyclops. 
and once they kill the cyclops, the, the, the body will, will break and release all the, these flagellated spores that will infect uh, mosquito larvae. Or it can end the, the cycle here, or it can like reach, uh, stay with the, the, the larvae and reach the, the, the adult phase of the mosquito. If they reach the adult phase, they will migrate to the ovaries and the, the, the mosquito, instead of laying eggs, will lay like sporangia of fungus, which is full of these uh, uh, flagellated ascospores. So they will, they will leave this fungal structure in the, the nesting place. So w once these hatch with full of fungal spores, we will infect a whole bunch of these uh, larvae that will be in this site as well. Another one is microsporidium, which is a uh, unicellular. They are obligate uh, intracellular pathogens, and once the, the insect uh, feed from, from one of, eat one of these spores, will reach the, the, the gut, and once in the gut, the spore will recognize by chemical, chemically recognize the, the cells and will shoot the harpoon in, in, the, in these cells, and then will transfer the, the protoplasm content to the to the cell, to the, the whole uh, to the whole cell, and then we'll multiply and maturate, and then burst the cell, and will be released again with the feces and reinfect other cells, other neighbor cells. As well. This other one is called the entomophthoroid fungus. It's one of the big groups. But this one specifically, <coughs> they infect the cicada. It's called Massospora cicadina. In fact, major cicada. Uh, they are found even, even here in, in Pennsylvania. And they do not require uh, the, the death of the host to sporulate and, 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 and produce spores. They, they can sporulate from the living body uh, of the host. So the host will start to fall apart and, and break into pieces and is still acting and normally. And here you can see the... You can see the a cicada. I don't know what's going on with the video. But we, we can see a cicada with the part of the abdomen which has broken and exposing the fungal, fungal tissue. I don't know what happened, but trust me, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what is in there. <laughs> so here's another entomophthoroid that spirulates from the living body of, of the host. So here it produces a, a pressure in the abdomen to form the, like this perfect circle that will expose the imanium full with this kind of cell that actively shoot the spores out from this hole. So as the fly fly away and, and, and walk, and we'll, we'll be releasing the spores everywhere where, where she, she goes. That's another, another entomophthoroid that infect this uh, species of beetle, Calogonatus pensylvanicus. And as the fungus develop in the, in the body of the host, it will start to, um, what's the name in English? I forgot the word. But, ah, so, so what, uh, swollen. The, the, the body will start swollen and will expose the fungal, the fungal part here. And we'll have this display that re, uh, resembles the, the display that they do to, to make. So once the, the, the fungal develop, the, the wing will open and will attract other male or female to mate. But once it touch, we'll touch a cadaver full with spores. So we will get infected. So that's a, a time lapse showing one of the entomophthroid fungus growing. Those are called biotrophic fungus that they can sporulate from the living, living body. But in this case, the, the host is already dead. I, I just included here to show how these hyphae grow from the, the, the joints and e everywhere in the, in the host. I don't know, it's something wrong with, with, with the, the computer here. The video is not playing properly. This time you don't need to trust, you can see the fungus there. <laughs> <laughs> That's another case, very interesting one. Those are one of the few basidomycetes. Basidomycetes are the ones forming uh, uh, rust, rust fungi, the mushrooms, and bracket fungus. And also this fun fungi, Fibrohizoctonia, is within this group. Those mimic termite eggs. And the termites are, are blind, and they live in the, in the nest on the ground. They're totally dark, so they cannot see, as we can see. Oh, that's totally different. This yellow and, and, and this stuff are totally different. But for the, the fungal structure, which, which is this orange one, mimic the diameter 
of the of the egg. So once the the termite will hold the egg, it will feel like an egg. So so the fungal structure will feel like an egg for the termite. So the termite will take care of these fungal structures and even bring in the, to the to the termite nest. And these fungus can live as saprophytes here, or they can switch to the parasitic phase and consume all the eggs. That's another basidomycetes. They're just these two groups of basidomycetes that infect, infect uh, insects. This one and this one. That's our, the Septobasidiales, comprised by about 200 species. They are kind of a lichens, but instead of have algae, they have the insects. They infect these scale insects that feed from the phloem. And these fungus use the insect as a gateway to the phloem and to drain sap and nutrients from the, from the plant. And so the insect is kept alive, but they are a slave, basically. But it doesn't change much for the, for the insect because they, they don't walk anyway. So they, they stay in the same spot for the whole life, even without, being, without fungal infection. So now we will narrow to the ascomycetes which is uh, the file that hosts the, the fungi that I work with, and I will be talking about a little about my work, what, I, what I've been doing here. So I've been working mostly with ant um, pathogens. Those are all species that are, this are all new species that I'm or already described or in the process of describing now. Uh, most of them from Amazon, but also from Africa, Australia, Japan, and Colombia. So those are the, the most important or the main complexes of entomopathogenic fungi within Ophiocordyceps. So this called Unilateralis complex, Nephophioides complex, Loidia complex, and Marmacophila erangiensis, and Australis complex. The Unilateralis complex is the most diverse, the most sophisticated. They produce complex spores, they change the behavior of the host and manipulate them, as we'll explain later. And the Nephophioides, it's a sister group that produce like whole spores. And these other groups produce like uh, part spores that, that are shot in, into the environment. And I will focus now in, in this group here, that's the, that present the most interesting characteristics. So how the hosts are infected? So these fungus infect one tribe of ants, Camponotini. It's uh, Camponotus and Polyrachis ants. But how do they, they infect these holes? Since they, they live in the canopy, and the fungus, of course, lives on the ground or, or not in the canopy. So once the ants go down to forage, leave the nest to go down to the forest floor to forage, it will eventually uh, encounter, encounter one of the, the fungal spores. And that's how it looks like. It like, looks like a worm. It's called a vermiform spore. And they produce a structure that we cannot see here very well, but it's like a trap that grows up. And once the, the, the ant passes through these spores, it will get attached to the abdomen, and then the fungal infection and the invasion of the body starts. So and these are the ants killed by, by the fungus. So th that's a video I made last year with National Geographic in Brazil and Amazon showing the, the first stage of development of this fungus. And after one or two weeks, after the, the, they get in contact with the spores, they climb onto vegetation and start to produce fungal everywhere. That's after, just after the, the ants dead, it's produced the fungus and, and start to grow this stalk that will uh, further produce a teleomorphic, it's called teleomorphic, a sexual stage of the fungus. And then we release the spore again on the ground. That's the, the sites I've been more intensively working in Brazil. So that's, two, that's four areas I have, been, I have been working mostly in this part here. It's close to the Manaus, but also other places like this, beautiful place, and also other ones. Different as you think, Amazon is a very heterogeneous environment. It's not a, just a plain full of green all the time. We have mountains, we have other stuff, and we have ticks, as we can see here. <laughs> So that's a beautiful landscape. We, we can work in a boat and then take a small boat to go to the streams and go more deep into the forest. And that's a lab setup. As you can see, a computer. Here we prepare the, all the cultures and we do microscopy, everything in the field. And then these things can, can happen eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I, I wanted just to show how is a, 
how's a plate for a species description? That's how I knew that. That's ten species. One, one of the ten species I'm, I'm describing. So here is one plate, another one. Here I show the picture of, of the, the species and the, all the microscopy. The screen is not helping, but we could see like the peritisium and all the, the spore producing structure. And we describe the spore and the germination because those are, are those are ecologically important structures. They are not just produce these as an additional morphology. It's like it's a trap. It's a functional morphology here. So all this morphology means something. It means one adaptation to infect a specific host. Remember that that every species of fungus infect one species of host. They they never they are very specialists. Here I want to show how we estimate the diversity in this group. So I've been sampling the Amazon for the last six years, and I'm collaborating with uh, a friend who worked with ant diversity, and he found uh, he has been collecting more than 71,000 of ants across 700, 750 kilometers in the Amazon, and he found 32 species of Camponotus here. And, and I found that 17 of them are infected by Ophiocordyceps, which is 53% of all Camponotus uh, ants are infected just by this group, the Unilateralis. Um, and if you take this into a global scale, which uh, 1,100 species of Camponotus, we would have 580 species to be described. So I, I, I think I have a job for my whole life. <laughs> And those are the ones I, I'm, I'm working on. That's already described. That's two. So uh, I hope to get about 30 new species described to the, the end of my PhD, hopefully. They are everywhere. In the so that's a, an interesting uh, adaptation that these fungus developed, the Nifofioides. That's another group. That's not the Unilateralis anymore. They infect the turtle ants. And they die always in the, the base of the trunk where the moss is covering the base of the trunk. And they produce these structures that they are asexual structures. And these ants die in this, in this part. And these structures grow underneath the moss. And they just, they grow underneath the moss and then suddenly poof, just pop out from, from, the, from the, the moss and to release uh, asexual spores, conidia here. But these ants, uh, realize that these nest mates are infected and try to remove them and, and throw them on the ground. So you can see around the tree you see many ants like that and the other ones trying to remove and, and throw them away. But these structures will ensure that the, the inoculum will still be there in the, in, the, in the tree because the ants just remove uh, the infected ones. They, they cannot remove these structures because they are growing underneath the moss. And they somehow mimic the sporophyte of the, the bryophytes, right? So that's a very interesting adaptation. That's a relationship with hosts. And the Nifofioides complex infect three diff very different groups of ants. And this unilateralis complex, which is the most sophisticated one, they all infect one tribe of ants, specifically two uh, genus. And all the other complex also can infect several ones, which that's a paper I'm, I'm working on. So we'll cross the phylogeny of the, the, the fungus with the phylogeny of the host, and we'll find that here, that's a, probably a host jumping events occurring because close related species infect this unrelated uh, host. And that's probably a co-evolution, co-speciation event because they, they probably, this group probably co-evolved with this group. And another adaptation, that's including a North American species. That's also a new species. Uh, all, all of the tropical species, 95% bites on, on leaves or uh, soft parts of, of plants, like um, spines. Some are soft, some are not so soft. I, I, I can tell. And, but these ones that live in temperate forests, they develop um, a strategy. They evolve the strategy to uh, bites into twigs instead of leaves because here the same picture, the, the same place in, in different uh, parts of the year. So if this fungus bite this leaf, three, four months later it will be on the ground dried and will never produce this spore. But 
the temperate forest species adapted to bite into twigs, so they can overwinter and form the spores in the next year. So they remain on, on, on that forest. That's again, that, that's a paper I'm working on to tell this story. We found that they, they evolved this trait four times. All species from, from temperate forests, and they evolved this trait four times independently. So it's a very cool adaptation. So I think I'm running out of time. So I'll, I'll stop here, and I hope to, to keep going with these, and I hope to tell you more the next time. Thank you. Does that mean that each Cabernet species is associated with its own individual species of fungi, or, or? that we don't know? Okay. Based on, on our surveys, I, I can I can tell that 53 percent of Amazonian species are are infected. But it can happen that next year I go there again, I found 10 more species, and, and then the curve never never get flat. So it's always finding something something new, which is good. You're asking if it was one to one, though, right? If it was one. Species of yeah. no, species of I think if you, you ask if every single species of Camponosus has a, a specific parasite to infect them, right? I, I guess I was asking if each one that is infected has a specific species. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. It's one to one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they are very different, not just based on molecular and phylogenetic studies, but they are clearly molecular, uh, morphologically different. So, do the phylogenetic relationships between the host and the parasite? resemble each other like I don't know I, I mean. oh, there's no family of the fungi no I, I will do this okay that's why <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I, I need to to get data from from the host extract DNA from all the hosts infected and then I will cross the two phylogenies uh -huh. and see what happens but I know that the one complex in fact one genus another complex in fact many genus so okay. that's so I, some are special I somehow know that one it's Host jumping and the other one is co speciation, co evolution. But I need to show it with data, not with thoughts. Um, I have a question about the snake fungus. Is that, I just was wondering if that's found in Pennsylvania or you said it was in, is it in all of North America? Uh, it's, it's pretty spread throughout North America. It's not been seen in every single state. Um, I do believe it's been found in Pennsylvania. Um, but we, it's, it's really, the numbers are very low when they find snakes infected with uh, this fungus because when you're dealing with something like bats, it's really easy to tell when you have an infection in the bats because you have 10,000 dead bats on the floor. Whereas with snakes, it's it's all a matter of finding the dead ones, which can be a challenge in and of itself. So, um, you said the snakes were getting infected during the hibernation, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when they come out of hibernation, and they're infected. Yeah. Okay, so they're still alive and they can transfer. Yeah, so so they can still be alive and be infected. Because okay. I was going to say, like, how does it transmit between? Yeah, we don't know. We don't. We have no idea how the transmission happens. We don't know if this is a widespread fungus that's found all throughout the environment. Um, we don't know if it's been recently introduced at this point, okay. where it's still just a big question mark at this point. So. The snakes do hibernate big dens, though, right? So. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Right, yeah, it's a possibility. Is the snake fungal disease always, you know, fatal for them, or is there signs that they can actually come back from having as their As much as I've read so far, that it's 100% it's fatal. Um, there's no, they haven't been able to, uh, and, and I'm thinking back to the most recent paper that I've read, which was 2015 paper, and they hadn't, they, they hadn't reported any way of curing it yet. Um, so at this point, it's, it's pretty much 100% fatal. Uh, do you think it's likely, likely there's more basidiomycete mushrooms growing like in streams and rivers that we haven't found yet? I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, the, the biologist in me says, I mean, yeah, there's got to be. Uh, maybe, maybe in 
in the streams that uh, that we now utilize a lot. Uh, there maybe there used to be uh, fruiting the city of my seeds uh, in, in those streams, and, and we changed the environment so much that they can no longer uh, live there. Who knows? Uh, but but this is the only one that we know of at this point. Similar question: Do you think there's other predatory fungi too that? Like, is it just the other there? Uh, there's, well, I mean, I guess it kind of, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, yes, I'd say the answer is yes, there's more. I don't know any off the top of my head, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> that actually, they're probably in the back of my head. But, <laughs> but, um, but I, 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 there are fungi, I mean, fungi kind of, they, they draw a fine line between what is predatory and what's parasitic in some cases, right? You know, we can consider what they do to nematodes predatory, and, and then you look at fungal infections in humans and animals and things like that. That's a parasite. It's technically consuming the animal, though. <laughs> um, so, so I mean, yeah. It's a, yes, they're probably. Uh, they do believe they are. I will shift to the other <laughs> so, Sorry for that. Um, so, the one that covers the scale insect. So do you think it's mutualism or not? Because scale insect is getting protection, I guess. So. Yeah, at the colony level, yes. But the individual level, it's being castrated. And okay. it will be, like, the, the fungal grow like coils that go into, into yeah. the, 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 the well, insect and, and drain nutrients from them. <laughs> at the colony level, it can be a mutualism, yes, because it benefits them to provide chambers to hide, like the non-infected ones can, can, okay. can occupy chambers. But the infected ones will be will be consumed and enslaved for his whole life. But individually, it's parasitic. But at the colonial level, it's mutualism. So you try to find the cures for like the bat fungus and for the, the sea turtles. I mean, do, you, do you do the same thing for the ants? I mean, does that no. Is that like a thing? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Because, because these fungus, uh, they, they, they help to maintain the, the, the ecosystem healthy. Because the ants that go out to forage are the older ones. The, the new ones and, and the fresh are, are within the nest taking care of the brood and, and doing their jobs within the nest. The ones that go out to forage, they are already old. And as the fungus, not, not that the old ones need to have to be killed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and because because doing this, the fungus will uh, make the, the the colony to always renewing with with new members and, and killing the old ones and, and the less um, active members to produce new ones. So it, it keeps the the, the the ecosystem healthy and also controlling huge populations because if you have one huge population of ants taking cover off all the place, it, it would be a just one species, there's no biodiversity. But if you control these species, you, you create a niche to other species to occupy the same niche. So it keeps the, the ecosystem, keeps the biodiversity. The complement to that question would be, are these other scenarios basically indicating that the environment, the ecosystem is kind of knocked out of whack, and that's why they're, uh, you see these predatory scenarios where you have fungus that would normally infect these hosts that are now infected this mm -hmm. host. You mean in the case of, of his, his yeah, I just think it's a really intriguing question. Yeah, but in the, I, I don't know about the stuff he presented. In, 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 the case of, in, in, in the case of frogs, it's like ex making them to go to extinction. So that, that's a different case. It's natural, but it's not desirable. I mean, you know that I know about the ants. Yeah. But I'm just saying, like, that's cool to think about. Yeah. yeah, a lot of these uh, organisms, a lot of these infections that we see are, are recent introductions. So it can be an invasive species, uh, like white nose syndrome, pseudogymnoscus destructans. Also, people like to name these, so they're really complicated. That's now. So, but yeah. uh, pseudogymnoscus <laughs> is invasive, and we're still trying to figure out. We, we know it's in Europe, we know it's in Russia, and we know that it, it causes infection in the bats there, but it does not kill the bats. You can, have a, you can have a fungal load on the bats in Russia equal to what you see in North America, and still no death of the bats. So we're still trying to kind of unravel what's going on here, and you know, how did it, you know, why, why did it all of a sudden, is it all of a sudden able to jump from Europe to North America? You know, this introduction, was it just this one-time introduction? Is, uh, you know, it's the same thing with, and then you go to, into the snake fungus and the sea turtle-like fungus, where we think there are things like environmental changes uh, uh, that are occurring that are
time making the animals more susceptible. Uh, a, a reoccurring pattern with fungal infections is when an animal gets stressed out or becomes, uh, in, in a sense, becomes more susceptible to anything, fungi really just love to take advantage of that. So, uh, in, in that case, it is, yeah, like a changing environment scenario. All right. Thank you all.